Hi, I'm Paul Beckwith. So this video, I ended up, um, you know, I'll continue from where the last video was. And I was talking about the climate of North American cities, how it will shift hundreds of miles in one generation. So a paper just came out and you can enter your, your city. There's 540 cities in the database. You can enter your city. You can, okay, there's links that are given in the article to, to, to come to this site, Future Urban Climate. And then you can just click on the links here to get the actual paper. And within the paper, you can click on, there's the paper here. Okay, uh, let's go to the top here. And I talked about this in the last video, Contemporary Climate Climatic Analogs for 540 North American Urban Areas in the Late 20th Century. Okay, so you can click on the links here and you can actually get a map and you can put in your location. So let's try, uh, you know, I did Ottawa. Um, let's do, okay, I got a backspace here. Let's do New York. New York, New York, okay, for example. So here we go. Okay, this is the line to the most similar climate. For high emissions, New York's climate in 2080 will feel most like today's climate near Jonesboro, Arkansas. So typical winters, 8 Fahrenheit, which is 4.4 Celsius warmer, 10.8% wetter than winter in New York. Okay, um, this is the average. This is showing all of the lines. Most of them are pretty strongly pointing to this, this location. Okay, so the average is over here. And if we reduce emissions, then we don't go anywhere near as far. Okay, 4.5 Fahrenheit or two and a half Celsius warmer in winter, 1.2% wetter, slightly more wetter. So a huge difference between, so it does, you know, what we do now in terms of our emission trajectories has enormous implications to what life will be like you know, assuming that uh, civilization doesn't collapse, things don't change too quickly. Um, we'll go back to um, the high emission scenario and let's look, get the similarity map as well. Okay, and here's the similarity map. Can't see too much. You can see the colors here. Okay, um, the climate similarity, high, low, there's a scale there and uh, you can see um, you know, you can play around with this app. So I encourage you to have a look at your city and see. Also, this is very useful. This will actually be more useful to see how our how, how food production in the country will change. You know, if you have a particular, you can find a city close to where the agricultural is region is for cotton, for example, and then do the high emissions forecast and see whether there's still anywhere in the country that where the conditions there's a climate analog region where that particular um, crop can still be grown in in your country for example i showed you an example with wheat in, in australia okay the wheat growing regions of southern australia are being pushed completely off the um, continent of australia so this is uh, for north america this study we need this type of thing for the entire planet. I think that would be very useful. But again, you know, uh, losing Arctic sea ice, jet streams go completely crazy. Everything changes. You know, as good as these studies are, they're not going to be a good picture of reality in a world with no sea ice and jet streams that are completely unrecognizable to today's. Now, speaking of the Arctic, okay, uh, going back to Twitter, um, I did show you, you know, on my Twitter feed, there's an article here about extremely cold air masses in the Arctic have undergone, has undergone a drastic reduction of about 80% over the past 60 years. So what's all that about? Okay, so this is, if you Google indicators and trends of polar cold air masses, you get this paper. Click on the article PDF, it's open source. This is what we get here. Okay, so let me uh, talk a little bit about this paper. Okay, uh, I've talked a lot about Arctic temperature amplification. The Arctic is getting to be a darker place. The overall reflectivity of the Arctic used to be 52% of light would be uh, reflected. That's the albedo. 
Okay, that was 30 years ago. That's a series uh, satellite study, NASA study. Now the reflectivity is 48%. So that 4% difference in reflectivity, that light is being absorbed in the Arctic. The Arctic's heating up because of the because its surfaces are darker, it's losing sea ice, it's losing snow cover. When it loses sea ice, the, the white ice is replaced by a dark ocean. When it loses snow cover, the white, bright, highly reflective snow layer is replaced by the tundra permafrost underneath, which is dark. So it absorbs that light instead of reflecting it away. So the Arctic is heating up like crazy. Arctic temperature amplification. Okay, um, every time the jet stream ridges go up into the high Arctic in the winter, for example, completely dark, there's a, it brings a temperature above zero degrees Celsius right at the North Pole in the middle of the winter. All that, you know, all that heat and you get vapor, water vapor carried up there, carrying huge amounts of latent heat. The Arctic is losing its cold air and that cold air is being displaced a lot of it was being displaced south by the polar vortex in the last few months over North America, right? Uh, you might, so this is, uh, you know, this is abrupt climate change. The distribution of heat on the planet is completely changing. The cold air that used to be up in the Arctic is spilling out, going elsewhere, being replaced by warm air. You know, this is all a transition state as we head to a much warmer Arctic with no ice, no sea ice, no snow cover, huge glacial melt of Greenland, very, very exponentially rising sea levels and, you know, and, and very, very high risk of extreme emissions of methane from both the permafrost on land and underneath the ocean, as opposed to what um, some people like Michael Mann might have been saying recently. Um, I should go in great detail about those videos that came out, <coughs> sort of downplaying the idea of methane being a problem. Um, many, many years ago, I joined the Arctic Methane Emergency Group. Methane is a problem. It's a wild card. And, uh, you know, people that downplay it are not doing, they're not helping. You know, it's a huge risk uh, that will rocket us up to much warmer temperatures and make us have difficulty growing food, etc. And, you know, it's, it's, it's all a matter of risk. So for people that are downplaying the risk, I want to see numbers of what they think the probability is. And then, you know, we can argue on certain numbers as opposed to arguing on, say, all or nothing type things, right? There's a lot of gray areas in between. So this paper looked at, so it didn't, when we talk about Arctic temperature amplification, it's mostly how the surface temperature is changing, but the temperature varies throughout the whole atmosphere. Um, and the troposphere, the lowest layer of the atmosphere, it's uh, the, 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 it's the lowest l layer of the atmosphere where all the weather happens, and then the stratosphere is above the troposphere. The dividing line is called the tropopause. That dividing line is 17 kilometers high near the equator and only about 7 kilometers high up in the Arctic. Okay, so the cold air, air is all compressed and it's heavier and it's stuck closer to the surface. Okay, so if we measure the amount of, you know, temperature varies throughout that layer, of course. So if we look at the volume of coldness, if you like, we, we come up with a couple different parameters, not just looking at surface temperature. And these two indicators or parameters are polar cold air mass, PCAM. That's the amount of air below a potential temperature threshold and something called negative heat content which includes a weighting by coldness. So the amount of cold air multiplied by the density, so it gives you kind of like, a, you know, a heat capacity, the amount of coldness, if you like. So these two metrics are based on multiple layers in the atmosphere. So it's a much more comprehensive framework for assessment of warming that's provided rather than just looking at surface air temperatures. The negative trend, so we're losing, these things are both trending down. We're losing the polar cold air mass. We're losing the negative heat content. Things are warming, okay? Now, when you have a threshold of 245K, zero degrees Celsius is 273.15 Kelvin. So 280, that's about seven degrees Celsius. 245, uh, minus 273, that's about 
28, minus 28 degrees Celsius. So when you have a threshold, if you look at all the air below this temperature, we've lost air, extremely cold air, much faster than we've lost the moderately cold air. We've lost 80%, in fact, um, in, in, uh, over the time period that they looked at. Okay, and then they tried to look at the causes. So let's have a look at the image at the uh, figures here in this paper. Again, this is, you can, you know, so they tried to basically integrate over the height of, over, oh, like you look in the entire troposphere, you look at the temperatures, you know, as you go up to the top of the troposphere, you come up with these two metrics of how much cold, the volume of cold air, and then the heat capacity, if you, if you multiply by a density or mass, and uh, we're losing the cold air. So this is showing you sort of the uh, the PCAM at 280 Kelvin, 245 Kelvin, right? And uh, how much air there is, and then the differences, how it's changing over time, pressures and things like that. You know, this is the PCAM again over the years, decreasing down in Northern Hemisphere, 60 degree north line. Okay, um, the trends downward, and uh, the tr here's the trends again, for, you know, at different temperatures and so on. So when you go to colder temperature, we're losing a lot of the very cold air and the warmer, the, the air that's not quite as cold is not decreasing as much. Um, you know, all the trends are in there. And uh, I'm not going to go into all of these in great detail. I'm just going to, there's correlations with, you know, looking for causes. Well, we know, we know why. Okay, so let's look at the conclusion. Okay, the amount of cold air mass in the Arctic, including mostly the extremely cold air mass, is greatly declining. Okay, the negative trend of these two parameters is, uh, as a percentage per decade, is the colder air is decreasing more strongly. Okay, we've lost 80%. The most recent time period shows that the most rapid loss of negative heat content indicates an acceleration. So things are accelerating. We know about these exponential trends. Okay. Um, and what else is there? Here we go. Regardless of the drivers, the results obtained here show that extremely cold air mass in the Arctic has undergone a dramatic reduction by about 80% over the past 60 years. The magnitude of this decrease suggests that the cold air mass metrics used here are robust indicators of change that should be part of a continued monitoring for change in the Arctic and the broader climate system. You know, it talks about the implications for humans and ecosystems up in that region. Okay, and it says that, uh, you know, it talks about, um, what else is there? It doesn't talk enough about how it affects the jet streams and climate, extreme weather events at lower latitudes, but we know, basically, we know, we know what's happening. I mean, we get Arctic temperature amplification, losing Arctic sea ice and snow cover, the Arctic is losing its coldness. So this is a technical paper that talks about how the Arctic is losing its coldness at all different altitudes. As you go up through the troposphere, you're losing coldness and the colder air is going the quickest. So this is a trend that is happening um, quickly, you know, exponentially, and it's going to lead us to an Arctic without without uh, sea cover, without uh, sea cover, without ice cover over the Arctic Ocean, without snow cover over the land regions and also over the ice, you know, realize that, uh, you know, there's going to be lurches and, and uh, unexpected events because as you get closer and as you warm, but you're still under zero, then there's more snowfall. Right, but the amount of water vapor going up into the Arctic is huge. It's carrying all that latent heat because the jet streams are so distorted, and uh, you know we're moving rapidly to an Arctic with without uh, without any more ice. So thank you for listening, um, and uh, please check out my website, paulbeckwith.net.